Are you having a tough time sleeping, even with my sultry tones? Well, I've got the app for you. Introducing Endel, the groundbreaking environment-based app that's here to change the way you relax, focus, and sleep. Endel takes everything we know about sound and combines it with cutting-edge technology. It's not just any app, it's science in your pocket. And for those restless nights, Endel's sleep mode soothes you into a deep, restful slumber with soft, gentle sounds curated for you. And if you're struggling to concentrate, Endel's focus mode boosts your productivity, helping you to stay on track for longer periods. All you gotta do is plug in your set work time and it'll curate a soundscape that's perfect to fit that session. Like I said, Endel is created and backed by science. Their soundscapes are based on neuroscientific and psychoacoustic principles. But don't take my word for it. A recent survey showed that many Endel users with ADHD, tinnitus, and sleep disorders say that the app helps them manage their symptoms. Are you ready to experience the magic of Endel for yourself? Click my link down below in the description or pinned comment. And the first 100 people to download Endel by clicking my link below or scanning the QR code on screen will get a free week of audio experiences. Don't miss out on this incredible offer. Transform your relaxation, focus, and sleep with the Endel app today. Isn't Halloween the best? I was never a huge fan of Halloween until I got to college. Me and my girls would get all dolled up and have these massive parties every year. It's something we've continued well into our adulthood. Well, let me rephrase that when I mean by dolled up. We take Halloween very seriously. We don't just wear skimpy costumes for the sakes of being cute. We get extremely dressed up and go all out. Several years ago, my fiancé went as Wolverine and I went as Rogue from the X-Men. Our costumes were homemade and I would argue better than the films. Last year, he went as a post-apocalyptic Willy Wonka and I was a zombified Oompa Loompa. So yeah, when I say dolled up, I mean we go all out. I don't remember the exact year, but it was definitely more than five years ago and I was in my 20s. I hadn't met my fiancé yet, so I was still a single lady, as Beyoncé would say. The specific year's Halloween costume party was going to be at my friend Bella's house. She had gotten married that summer and this was the first big party she was having at her and her husband's new home. It was a big, beautiful home with a ton of land. He was a lawyer or something like that and she had some government jobs so they did alright financially. Every year since we started the costume party tradition, my friends and I would come up with a theme for our costumes. That year the theme was Morbid Fairy Tales. I was dressed up as Little Red Riding Hood, except I had just butchered the Big Bad Wolf, so my costume had a lot of fake blood and I was wearing a lot of grotesque fake wounds. As always, my costume was getting a lot of attention. I loved the attention because I always worked really hard on my costume, and earlier in the night I noticed someone standing in the kitchen. It was a person with a smaller frame and they were wearing slightly baggy jeans, a navy blue sweatshirt and they were wearing a Frankenstein mask. I pointed out this detail about the person in the kitchen because it felt like the person was kind of just staring right at me. And I don't mean that kind of stare that I get on Halloween because of my costume being intense. The stare felt almost weird, a little malicious. You can say what you want about feelings, but I had a feeling in my gut about that person. So much of a feeling that I left the area and went to stand in the living room on the other side of the house. A few hours went by. Tons of mingling and talking to people and then I noticed that person again. This time they were standing on the back porch and it still looked like they were sort of staring at me. I don't know why it made me so unnerved and uncomfortable, but it did. The way Bella's house was set up was that the living room was all windows except for a big sliding door. The door opened to a huge wraparound porch and people were outside on the porch drinking and having a good time since it was a beautiful night. Except this Frankenstein person who was just standing against one of the wooden railings on the porch, staring inside the windows, still seemingly directly at me. I tried to get Bella so I could ask her who that person was, or at the very least I could see if I was just kind of being paranoid. Unfortunately, I couldn't get Bella alone and I didn't want to start any issues at the party. 
I walked away and tried to focus on having a good time. Thankfully, not long had passed and I had sort of forgotten about old Frankenstein. The people at the party started to thin out at around midnight. At this point during the night, I had completely forgotten all about the masked person and I really wished that I hadn't because I was about to be reminded of them in the worst possible way. Bella's house is on a small hill. The basement of the house has a door that leads to the backyard. The way the house sits, the backyard is level with the basement and the front of the house is elevated from the hill. I know that may sound confusing, but it's the best way that I can describe the house and it's important to know for this next part of the story. Outside of the basement door in the back of the house underneath the wraparound porch was where Bella kept all her trash and recyclables. I decided to stay a little later and help Bella clean since the house was a mess. I told her that I'd take down all the boxes from the kitchen and throw them in the recycling bin. Now if I had remembered how uncomfortable I felt earlier in the night from that masked person, I would have never have done this alone, but as they say, hindsight is always 2020. I made one trip down to the basement and out the door with no issues. When I re-entered the basement from outside, I thought that I heard some shuffling in the basement. I listened intently for a second but didn't hear anything. I didn't know the house that well, so it's entirely possible that the house was just making some weird noises. That's what I told myself anyway. I went upstairs and grabbed another load of recyclables. When I got downstairs, I noticed the outside door was shut. I knew I left it open because I didn't want to have to set down all the recyclables to open the door. Assuming it was the wind or some kind of draft, I just set everything down so I could open the door again. As I was putting the boxes of bottles down, I happened to look to my right, and I saw that green Frankenstein mask reflecting some light. In that moment, I was immediately reminded of how I felt earlier in the evening. The worst part was that they didn't move. I don't think they noticed me right away. I tried to move slowly and calmly to the door so I didn't bring any attention to myself. As soon as I grabbed the doorknob, the figure charged from their hiding position. I screamed, but I don't think anybody heard me since Bella and a few people who were left upstairs were blasting music while they were cleaning. The person put me in a bear hug, but as I said earlier, they were on the smaller side so I was able to shake them off. It freed me up for a second that I needed to open the door and run into the backyard. I was still screaming, hoping that somebody would hear me. I looked back while I was running, and they were chasing me. What a horrible memory that is burned into my mind. I must have made enough noise in the backyard because Bella's husband saw me from the kitchen and ran as fast as he could to chase that Frankenstein person. He tackled the person to the ground, and the grunt I heard surprised me. Bella ran outside already on the phone with the police, and her husband ripped the mask off, and it was a woman underneath the Frankenstein mask. She was screaming and crying. She looked crazy and ten times scarier with the mask off. The police showed up and did apprehend the woman. Bella asked if I knew the woman, and not only did I not know her, but I had never seen her before in my life. After some time had passed and we got the entire story, we realized how messed up it was. This poor woman attacked me thinking that I was somebody else. You see, she had recently separated from her husband and thought that I was the woman that her husband was now seeing and potentially cheating with prior. And in some weird coincidence, me and the woman that she thought I was share a name. She found me on social media and saw me posting about this party. I don't know what she planned on doing to that poor woman and thank God I'll never figure it out. Now I understand a broken heart can make you do some insane things, but this is something I never expected to happen. And at the end of the day, I just hope this woman gets the help that she needs. At least now, I'll always have a crazy Halloween story that I can share. My wife and I love Halloween more than anything in the world, and we're also fortunate enough to be financially stable. It took me several years of saving and investing, but I was finally able to open a haunted house and hayride attraction. Starting in October, every Friday and Saturday night, we would host the attractions. We'd go all out. 
We built sets, hired actors, and did everything we could think of to scare our guests. One thing we did that I didn't see a lot of other attractions do was that we changed our attractions every year, like drastically changed them. We gained a following for several years before we decided to close up shop a couple of years ago. Not because it wasn't financially viable, but because of an almost horrible accident that happened on the grounds. Now, for legal reasons, I'm not allowed to say the name of the horror attraction site because it still operates every year. Instead of just closing, I sold it to a buyer that kept the name the same. How frightful. Wink, wink. In case that went over your head, that's as much of a clue about the name of the park as I can say. And before selling it, we operated the park for 11 years. I'd like to say that every year was better than the previous, but my wife disagrees. I guess technically she's right because the last year that we were in charge, it ended very badly. Every year on the last night of the attractions, when we closed the park for the evening, my wife and I would hold a massive party for all of the cast and crew. Everyone from the parking lot team to the actors and costume scaring guests were included. We would have a massive bonfire, cook s'mores, and even have the projector showing horror movies on the side of the garage. Everyone would stay in costume and try to scare one another. I always loved it. I used to look forward to this party every year. This specific year, the party was a little more rowdy than usual. A lot of these people were a rare breed, so getting a little crazy at the party is not uncommon. Some of the people there asked if they could go through the attractions by themselves. I thought it was a fun way to have the mind scare themselves, so of course I said it was fine. One by one, a few people were going through the attractions. Even with no actors, you could still hear some of the screams from inside. And as the creator, I loved it. It was validation that I did a good job on the setup. One of the attractions we built that year was designed to look like an old school. I don't know why, but when I was a kid, the thought of being in a school after dark always freaked me out, so I thought, hey, let me bring my fear to life. When the attraction was up and running for guests, I would have actors inside the school. The first few rooms seemed like normal classes. It was bright and vibrant, and the actor was the teacher teaching children. The guests would only see the black of the children's head because they were mannequins. As you continue down the hall, one of the actors would run out of the classroom screaming and holding their neck. They would claim that the student bit them. The actor would slowly turn into a monster and start chasing the guests. The power would then flick and then the guests would need to escape the school. Then dozens of actors would serve as other infected and we would have the sound effects of fists beating on doors, implying that the monster students are locked behind doors. It was awesome and just enough interactivity to suspend that disbelief. As cool as that sounds, going into that attraction without the actors is kind of pointless. This was one of those attractions that needed actors to really sell the fear. Even with sound effects turned on, with nothing chasing you, it's just a big dark maze. One of the girls came out of the exit of the attraction and she was shaking. Everyone of course started ripping on her for being scared of her own shadow and that's when she said to me, I hate you guys. A little warning would have been nice. I just didn't expect any other actors in there. You guys really scared the hell out of me. My wife and I looked at each other. We knew that there were no actors inside the attraction. Everyone was still laughing and having a good time and didn't really pay attention to what she was saying. When she walked away, I pulled her aside and asked her what she meant by an actor. She said that when she was walking through part of the attraction, two people ran right in front of her. She didn't bother to see if they did anything because the shock of it scared her so much that she ran to the end as fast as she could. I decided to turn on all the lights in the attraction and walk through just in case. I was about halfway through when I saw two guys sprinting for the exit. I started to chase after them, but they were way faster than I was. One of the employees was standing near the exit and saw the two men running out. He actually ended up tripping the one guy which surprised the other guy enough for me to catch him and then take him to the ground. My wife was watching and alerting the police right away, and they showed up, and these two guys were arrested. And it ended up being a really messy situation. One of the guys was the ex-boyfriend of one of my actors, and the other guy was his cousin. They were waiting for her to go through the attraction. They didn't admit to anything, but they were arrested with knives in their possession so whatever they had planned wasn't good. 
The woman who saw them when they walked through resembled his ex, and the police think that the attacker was about to attack until he realized it was the wrong woman. Obviously, the woman who was almost attacked and the intended victim that never went through the attraction were both traumatized and in shock. The whole ordeal was just too much, and that's what ultimately led my wife and I to sell the property. Some people really aren't wired correctly. I don't know what the plan would have been if this poor woman had gone through the attraction. I lost sleep for a while thinking about that, and it's been several years since that night, and as far as I know, nothing like that has happened with the new owners. This Halloween season, if you decide to party, please be careful, and maybe don't go anywhere alone. For the last six years, the company I worked for has held an awesome Halloween party. Six years ago, the owners had changed hands and the new owners love Halloween. The only other time of the year the company hosts a party is for Christmas and that party is your typical corporate party. The Halloween party is not at all what you would expect from a company party. The owners go out of their way to make sure the party's awesome. The best catering, open bar, and even a driving service so nobody has to drive home after they've been drinking. The coolest thing about the Halloween party, though, is the costume contest. This isn't just your best costume wins type contest, it's so much more. The company incentivizes everyone to partake by offering a $500 gift card and a vacation destination every year. The owners pay for everything themselves and make sure everyone has a good time no matter what. One of the rules they described after the first year was that the same person could not win twice. That's a bummer for me because I won the second year. Now instead of participating in the contest, I'm one of the judges, which is awesome. It's usually just the upper management team that judges and they're a bit older than everybody else. With me as one of the judges, I'm able to provide a more youthful eye, which is needed a lot of the time because some of the costumes are from pop culture and the older crowd has no idea where it's from. This year's Halloween costume party almost didn't happen though. The incident last year almost ruined it for everyone, and for me personally, I almost lost a lot more than a Halloween party. Last year's event started just like every other year. The company gives everyone the day off on the last Friday before Halloween. If Halloween falls on a Friday, they'll still do it the Friday before, so parents can take their children trick-or-treating on the actual day. Instead of working on Friday, we all gathered that night at 7 p.m., the party formally goes until 11 p.m., but usually everyone stays much longer. For the first few hours, people were eating, drinking, mingling, and submitting their names for the costume contest. Of course, you don't have to participate, but most people do so they can have a chance to win that prize. Around 9 in the evening, we gathered everyone in the main lobby. It's a huge lobby that comfortably fits everyone. Whoever is hosting the event will start calling each person up one by one to show off the costumes. Some people come up solo, some doubles, and even some groups came up to present. I saw some awesome costumes. After everyone presented, we said that we would announce the winner at 10 p.m. In the meantime, everyone was just hanging out and enjoying the company party. At about 9.45, I realized that I had left my laptop in the office. Instead of leaving my laptop at the office all weekend, I figured that I would just run upstairs quickly and grab it. Admittedly, I was being one of those people walking with my head down on my phone while I was walking upstairs. Since I had a few free minutes from the party, I wanted to get caught up with my social media, my group text messages, and my fantasy football. In other words, I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings. I opened the door to the office and didn't even compute to me that the door was unlocked. I was even holding the key in my hand while I was texting. I just opened the door on autopilot. My desk cubicle was on the far left side of the office. I didn't turn any of the lights on and just made my way down the row of desks on my left. When I got to my desk, I sat down in my chair and finished my last text. After sending the messages, I came back to my senses. I looked around my desk and I was at a loss for words. My computer, which was right there on top of my desk on Thursday night when I left, wasn't there. I looked around trying to think to myself if I had brought it into the car. The more I thought about it, the more confident I became that I was certain I left it right on my desk. While I was trying to solve this mystery, I heard a voice come up from the other side of the office. It was a deep and bellowing voice and it said, 
Okay, hurry up. I ducked down in my cubicle and peeked around the wall. I saw three dudes wearing masks. These really weird, generic bunny masks. Nothing unique about them. I watched them for a minute or two trying to figure out what they were doing. I didn't recognize the voices, so right away I clearly knew that they didn't work in any specific office. I started to focus on what they were doing. They each were carrying two bags, and I saw one of the masked men grab something off one of the desks and throw it in the bag. And that's when I realized what was happening. I dropped down fast, trying not to bring attention to myself, and I accidentally bumped my chair. My heart was about to burst through my chest because I knew it made a noise, and I heard that same deep voice say again, What was that? I heard something down there. I didn't know what to do. I thought about running. I thought about screaming. I thought about calling the police. At the end of the day, though, I just stood as still as a statue. I could hear them creeping up closer to my cubicle. I didn't know if these guys had weapons or what, and I didn't want to find out either. When I heard the guy right near my cube, I started to crawl around the backside. This way, if the other two were by the door, they wouldn't see me. The man shouted to the other guys and said something like, I don't know what the noise was, let's just leave. And then I heard the comforting steps of them walking away. When he shouted that to the other guys, the voice sounded like it was right on top of my head. If he had walked only another few inches, he would have seen me for sure. When I heard the office door close, I called the police right away, told them what happened. They showed up fast, but those masked men were already gone. They checked the cameras, but couldn't get enough information to actually hone in on them. They had them briefly on camera a few times, but they didn't see what vehicle they got into, and due to the costumes that they were wearing, they were covered from head to toe, so there were no specific details that could be seen. They robbed my computer as well as a bunch of others from the office. They didn't rob any other office in the building, literally specifically only mine, and that led the cops to believe that whoever robbed us had some relation with someone who works in my office. And now, nearly a year later, they never found them. I never got that laptop back either, and this experience was truly traumatic for me. I felt like I was playing a real-life game of cat and mouse, and like I said, this year's party almost didn't happen. The only difference this year is that the party will be at a specific location, and I hope above all else, I don't see those bunny masks. I have always loved Halloween. I mean, ever since I was a little kid, I have loved the holiday. I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to call Halloween a holiday, but I am. After last year, though, I'm not sure if I'll ever feel that same love and admiration for it, though. Last year, I moved to this new town in the summer. Unfortunately, it wasn't close to my hometown, and in fact, it's nearly on the other side of the country. We live in a time, though, where I have to go where the money is, at least while I'm relatively young. And as fall was approaching, I realized that Halloween was right around the corner, and this was about to be the first year that I didn't have anybody to celebrate with. Now, when I was younger, I used to watch horror movies all month long with my grandma. When I got older, my buddy Jason and I would watch scary movies every night and just hang out outside. Now, Jason was a smoker, so we used that as an excuse to be outside and we'd sit around the bonfire all night just soaking up that crisp fall air. Needless to say, last year was the first Halloween that I had nobody to share my time with. I'm not great at meeting people and making friends. Sure, I had my work friends, but they weren't really the sort of hangout outside of work friends, you know? And somehow at work one day, the topic of Halloween came up in conversation. My ears perked up because Halloween is like a drug to me. And the guy that I worked with, I'll just call him Russell, started talking about a Halloween party. Some of the details I couldn't really hear because he wasn't exactly right next to me, but I know I heard the phrase Halloween party. Now I approached Russell and asked about the party, and he looked at me and smiled, and so did several of my other co-workers. Russell put his hand on my shoulder, smiled and said, I don't know if it's really your thing. I got excited and I started talking about how I love Halloween and being outside at night during the fall and all that good stuff. My coworkers were looking at me sort of funny, but Russell was just nodding and smiling. He started to tell me about the party this weekend and asked if I could join. 
So I was excited as anyone would be, but I tried to keep my emotions in check in front of all my new peers. I didn't want them to think that I was lame or something like that. Russell asked if I could drive because the driver wasn't able to go anymore. That was a really way of wording it, but I didn't give it a second thought. Even if they were just using me for a ride, which I thought about after the fact, I was still pumped to get out of the house and actually do something for the Halloween season. I agreed and Russell told me to pick them up from the work parking lot at about 10pm Friday night. That was late for me, but I wanted to prove that, you know, I could hang with the guys. Friday night came and I pulled into the lot a little after 10. Russell and three other co-workers were already standing there waiting to be picked up. They were wearing these strange orange masks and Russell had a bag with him, like a sort of gym bag of some kind. They all got into my SUV and Russell started to guide me. While I was driving, Russell said something like, Oh, I forgot, take this. We need to make sure that you're covering your face too. I just took the mask and put it on top of my head, sort of like a hat for the time. It was probably too late at this point, but this is when I finally started to feel extremely weird about all of this. Number one, why the heck did I have to drive? If it was to be a designated driver, that's fine, but it was never really mentioned. And number two, why was I picking them up from work? Sure, it could be for convenience sake, but then that brings me to number three. Why the heck were they wearing these masks, and why did I need one? I could feel my heart beating really fast. You know when you can just feel something is wrong, and you're just kind of locked into a situation? That's exactly how I felt. I sort of got quiet, and Russell noticed, and he started to push me a little bit and said things like, You good, dude? You're looking out of it right now. You having second thoughts? I didn't really respond. I gave him a generic answer and just kind of smiled. After about 15 minutes of driving, we pulled into some warehouse parking lot. Russell leaned over to me and said, Put your mask on, brother. It's time to party. I got out of the car with my new friends and made my way through the dark parking lot to the sealed door. I knew that there was no party on the other side of the door, but deep down I was hoping to see a raging party when they opened it. And that dream vanished right away when instead of opening the door, Russell started to pick the lock. I stood there, basically shivering in my boots. I had a million thoughts rushing through my head at once. Like, should I run? Should I call the police? Should I just partake in this obvious crime that was about to happen? What I did instead of any of those ideas was just stand there like a deer in headlights. Thankfully, I had a mask on because I'm pretty sure that I was crying tears underneath it. And a minute later, Russell picked this lock and we started to walk into the factory. He made some comments like, come on boys, or something like that as we were filing inside the building. No, I think this is what they call dumb luck, but not ten steps into the building, we heard someone scream, hey, you guys there, stop. I looked up and I saw two armed security guards running in our direction. I complied and froze and I put my hands up immediately, and that apparently was the wrong plan. Somebody grabbed me by the arm and told me to run, which I stupidly followed. We ran to the car, driving off. Russell told me to take us all back to his house for the night, which again I did without question, and I was terrified all night. I couldn't stop thinking about the cops showing up. It was my vehicle, so if anybody was getting caught, it would have been me. And I lost sleep for days and even weeks thinking about that night. Thank God I was never caught somehow. And I always considered turning them in, but I couldn't help but feel that I would get in trouble as well because at the end of the day, I was an accomplice. Now I'm sure one day I'll be served a dish of fresh karma. We never really spoke about that night again. Russell stopped working there only a few months later, and I found out from one of my co-workers that Russell actually used some code name, Blank Holiday Party, whenever he actually wanted to rob something. For example, this was a Halloween party. The warehouse was some sort of furniture warehouse that he used to work at, and he wanted to rob the safe that he knew was there. He was an amateur criminal, for sure, and he tried to bring me and several co-workers down with him. The other co-workers successfully robbed a few places with Russell before that night, but after almost getting caught, they never did it again, another reason why I never turned them in. Now listen, I know I'm partially to blame here, and I could have done a million things differently, but I didn't. 
The story's been killing me for the last year, so I wanted to share it and just get it off my chest anonymously. I still work at that place and live in that town. I have a few friends now, but this year, and most likely forever, I'm staying away from Halloween parties. Every year around this time, I am reminded of the most horrifying event of my life. When I was around 17 or 18 years old, I was hanging out with my group of friends who, looking back, were a pretty negative influence. I had gone from a small circle of friends to a larger group of friends who were more in the popular crowd and were experimenting with drinking and smoking. My parents were always very strict, so I had to be super careful when it came to making plans. Most of the time, I would have to sneak out of the house after they went to sleep. Now, getting back to the story, I was currently grounded for, I think, maybe three months for being caught drinking by my parents before. I remember them being really upset with me and disappointed with how I had been acting during that time in my life. I got grounded a few weeks before Halloween, and my friends were having a huge party. They were all trying to talk me into sneaking out and attending. I remember feeling like there was no way that I could miss this party and I would regret it forever if I did. Isn't it funny what we think are priorities when we're young? I planned to sneak out and walk to the party as it was only a few blocks from my home. I wasn't going to dress up in case I needed to make a quick return home and pretend that I had been in bed the entire time. The night came and I was feeling guilty or maybe I was getting cold feet about going. I knew my parents would probably ground me for a year if they caught me and I was actually getting along really well with them lately and I didn't want to change that. After toying with the idea of not going, I changed my mind after dozens of texts from my friends telling me what I was missing at the party. I snuck out of my window quietly and made my way to the party and as I approached it, I could tell that it was super loud, so I figured it was only going to be a matter of time before the cops came and they broke it up. My friends were all excited when I showed up and started handing me drinks so I could catch up. I drank a little bit and then found myself having to go to the bathroom. Most of the party was taking place in the kitchen and out on a screened-in back porch. The bathroom that was closest was in the basement. My friend told me it was down the stairs and directly to the left. There was no one down there when I went down, so I quickly used the bathroom so I could head back up the stairs to the group. When I got out of the bathroom, there was someone waiting outside the door and... I sort of said to them, Oh, sorry, all set. And when I moved to get out of the way, they moved in my direction. This happened once or twice, and I kind of anxiously chuckled and then just sort of bolted for the stairs. I asked my friend Mariah if she knew who this person in the black robe and white mask was, who was seemingly dressed up. She said she didn't, and I told her about us either blocking each other's path accidentally or him doing it on purpose, but... They clearly were being pretty creepy about it. She laughed and said that they probably like me. The mask wasn't like anything I'd seen before. It was sort of like a Michael Myers mask but with no hair, and it had been painted with X's over the eyes and also on the mouth. Now for the remainder of the night, I kept noticing the person in this mask. Wherever I went, it didn't seem like they were really far behind. If I went to another room, they would be there no less than a minute later and the same thing if I went outside. I tried to ignore it the best I could, and at that point, I wasn't drinking and wasn't really having fun. I told a few of my friends that I was going to head home. They were upset, but were too drunk to even remember. I started the walk back to my house, and I remember going really fast and wanting to get home as soon as possible. I got home and made it inside my window without waking my parents up and got into bed. I couldn't help but feel uneasy. I couldn't tell what was bothering me, but I was feeling really just anxious. I went up to grab a glass of water. I poured a cup and just chugged it and headed back to my room to see if I could settle down and just go back to sleep. On my way to my room, something caught my eye out of the living room window. It looked like there was something in the road. I got closer to the curtain and tried to make out what was in the road while not really being seen. And to my horror, it was the same mask that I had seen earlier continuously stepping in and out of the streetlight. I bolted from my room and just laid there, hoping I was imagining things or assuming it wasn't real and that this would just go away. I made sure my lights and TV were off and just sat there in silence. 
After about five minutes, I mustered up the courage to look out my window to see if I could see anything. As soon as I looked out the window, I saw that hooded person and that same mask with the paint on it from the party. Before I could even do anything else, I let out the loudest scream of my life. Frozen in bed, my dad came rushing in asking me what was wrong. He couldn't make out anything I was saying so I had to calm down and tell him the entire story. He called the police and reported the incident, but to my knowledge, nothing ever came of it. I think they did get a name since I could allegedly trace this person back to that party, but there was never really any proof. My parents were really upset with me sneaking out and putting myself at risk, but honestly, after that night I sort of turned my life around and I focused on school and reunited with my previous friend group. I still have a fear of Halloween and Halloween parties, even though it has been years, and I still feel uneasy when I see someone approaching me with a mask on. The events of this story happened when I was 21 and in my last year of college. I'm 34 now and still having terrifying flashbacks from this Halloween. My friends and I liked to party in college and Halloween was one of the best nights to party. We got to dress up in sexy and not so sexy outfits, not to mention it was an excuse to act a little crazy. My friends were all beautiful and had the boys drooling all over them and I was never considered one of the quote unquote hot girls but I didn't care. It really wasn't something I ever cared about. I was still friends with all the boys and I loved hanging out with my girls. Well, this Halloween, we had a party at my friend Steve's house. Like a lot of the college parties, we were basically kids and many people still didn't know how to handle their alcohol. At about 11, the cops were called for a noise complaint and we all ran because that's what everyone did in high school and apparently it carried over to college. My friend Amy told me to jump into a car with her friend Dave and he would take us to another party and I stupidly did. The car ride was weird, just him and I and he didn't talk much. The car smelled like beef jerky and had a hint of body odor. He had a mask but it was on his lap while he was driving. He had a hooded sweatshirt, some jeans and these brown work boots. He has a scraggly beard and greasy hair and I tried asking questions to make the drive not so awkward but he didn't really answer them. Finally, I asked what school he went to, and he responded, I dropped out of college a while ago. Okay, I thought, I don't want to judge a book by its cover, so I asked, well, how old are you? And he responded in a sort of shaky, almost nervous voice, and said that he was 37. Now, this freaked me out a little bit, because he's slightly older than I am now, and back then I was 21, and he's hanging out with a bunch of college kids, Trying not to let on to the fact that I was kind of nervous, I asked him, so how do you know Amy? And he responded with the most terrifying answer I could ever think of. In that still shaky and very unflattering voice, he said, who's Amy? And I sunk into my chair, clenching my sides, not knowing what to do. She's the blonde who told me to get in the car with you? I said, and he responded with this very stoic, oh. Her. Yeah. She told me you were single. I didn't respond. I honestly didn't know what to say. I was furious with Amy, scared stiff of my current situation and confused because it was pitch black outside and I had no idea what we were driving. After about a 10 or 15 minute drive, which seemed like forever, we arrived at a house. It was not a very nice part of town. All the houses on the block looked beat up or abandoned. I looked for Amy's car or any car I recognized, but it was just too dark to point anything out. We approached a red door with severely chipped paint only lit up by the dull front light, and Dave didn't even knock and just walked into the house. The house was cold and smelled awful, even worse than Dave's car. We walked into the front room, which I assumed would be the living room, it had a dirty and disgusting olive green shag carpet with an old brown couch. The walls were white with chipped paint everywhere you looked. Piles of pizza boxes and beer cans lined the floors, which you may think implies a party had been there, but these boxes of pizza were very old. The room was only lit by one lamp that was on the floor and it gave off a very low light. 
On the brown couch, there was a man and woman sitting very close, but not really moving. They looked to be passed out. We walked into the kitchen, which was just more of the same. Trash and the horrible smell of garbage. In the kitchen, there was a man probably in his 20s, maybe 30s, and he didn't look so good. I was still trying not to judge, but he was very clearly not in the right mental state. He gave Dave a sort of high five and introduced me to him as Skip. He looked at Dave and back at me and smiled. He had these weird teeth and bug eyes made my skin crawl. The other man in the kitchen was an older gentleman, and he seemed to be in his 40s or 50s, I really couldn't tell, and he said nothing and just looked at me. I felt sick to my stomach, and the only reason why I didn't run out of that place was because I had no clue where I was and no clue if these people were capable of anything dangerous. We walked into the back room, which was kind of like a screened-in porch. I felt a brief moment of relief seeing about six or seven people out there. There were only two girls out of the bunch, and... They seemed like half naked and weighed about 95 pounds. I could feel everybody staring at me, but at least there were a lot of people. I know it sounds crazy, but I felt almost safe just being around this larger crowd. But the safe feeling faded very quickly when the two girls walked away with all the guys. They all left this back porch, went upstairs, and shut the door. I didn't even want to know what was going to happen in that situation, but the conversation they were having outside told me everything I needed to know. As I sat in the screened-in room trying to think of my options, Dave finally spoke up and said, I think you're really cute. I said thanks and just kind of shrugged it off. He got up and started to rub my back and started to breathe very heavily. I should say this was behavior that I was not used to. Boys didn't really talk to me like this and certainly they didn't rub my back like that either. After about five minutes of the most unpleasant back rub I had ever had, he stepped in front of me and just sort of stared at me. He didn't do anything. He just uncomfortably stared at me and he was way too close to my face. I said to him in a sort of terrified voice, I'm sorry, but I'm not that kind of girl. And he says, I don't know about that. I can still hear the seriousness in the tone of his voice. I could feel the tears coming and then nothing short of a miracle happened. One of the girls who went upstairs began to scream erratically and cursed everybody out in the room. Dave, who at this point was inches from my face, ran upstairs leaving me downstairs in the back room alone. Without even thinking twice, I got up and climbed right out of the window and ran. Not knowing at all where I was, I just planned on running until I found a gas station or something. I was running down the street staying close to the sidewalk trying not to bring any attention to me. I really have no idea how long it was because I didn't have any cell phone on me and I finally approached this 24-hour Walmart. I walked in and had the night manager call my parents and they picked me up. It was about 30 minutes from my house in a small run-down town. The worst part about all of this was when I was waiting for my dad to pick me up, Dave and his friend Skip walked into that Walmart. They didn't see me and I couldn't believe it was them in there and they almost looked as if though they were actually looking for something, maybe me. The next day, Amy apologized all day, crying her eyes out, and I did forgive her, but I was still so shaken up by the entire ordeal. Every now and then, I'd see an old, beat-up, maroon-colored Buick parked at my work or school, and I'd start to tremble in fear. It's now been over ten years, and I still haven't yet to get over the mental trauma from that night. I know it could have been a lot worse for me and I'm lucky that I left with no physical harm, but I still wouldn't wish that experience that I had that night on my worst enemy. I also haven't seen Dave, Skip, or any of the people I met that night ever again. I urge you to please be careful if you choose to go out this Halloween and always know where your friends are because you may end up somewhere you don't want to and you may not be as lucky as I was. This is a creepy story that happened to me a few years back. Definitely more creepy than outright scary, but just thinking about it makes me squirm. It was October, and one of the local bars in town was having this sort of joint Halloween costume party. They did it every year, and it was always a blast. My friends and I would always go with our boyfriends every year, and we'd all try and compete with each other for the best couple costume. 
That specific year, I didn't have a boyfriend, so I didn't even dress up. That night started in a depressing way for me. I had only been recently single, so seeing all my friends be lovey-dovey with their boyfriends was not super exciting for me. I ended up popping a squat at the bar and just started getting some drinks. I was talking and joking a little bit with my friends, but I was more focused on my drink, if I'm being honest. I have no idea what time it was, but at some point, some random guy with a really long white beard and long white hair sat next to me. He was sort of wearing a half mask, like think Batman's mask, but without the pointy horns on top and no back. I tried making conversations with the guy, but he wasn't very lively. A lot of one-worded answers and grunting. I started to get a nasty vibe from him, so I started to give him a bit of the cold shoulder. I was hoping that he was going to get the hint that I didn't want to talk anymore, and I thought that I got my wish because about ten minutes later, he got up and moved to an open bar stool on the opposite side of the bar. To paint a picture for you, the bar was probably thirty feet long and was a giant rectangle, so it was thirty feet across from where I was sitting. The masked man was across from me and probably four stools over. The night continued and I decided to drink water and just Pepsi for the rest of the night so I could drive home. I still sat at the bar and talked to the bartender and a few guests who were sitting nearby. Every so often I would look up and look like the bearded man was looking at me. I tried ignoring it because I'm used to creeps at the bar and I've gotten good over the years of turning them down. For some reason though I couldn't stop noticing this guy. It was probably the mask that he was wearing but either way I was just done sitting there. I got over myself and finally started conversing with my friends. We were dancing and hanging out and I started having a great time. Who needs a man anyways? And while we were all dancing, I decided to take a little break and just visit the little girl's room. The bathrooms were in the back of the bar and behind this uncomfortably narrow hallway. I always hated having to use the bathroom at this bar because it was always awkward trying to get around someone standing in the hall. I was so happy when I turned the corner and didn't see anyone in the hall though. I went into the women's room, did my business, and just touched up my makeup a little bit. It was warm in the bar that night, so I had a nice glow of sweat going on. I walked out of the restroom, and standing at the end of the hallway was that masked guy with the beard. I don't know why I said this, but the first thing that came to my mind was, Sup, bro? And as soon as it left my lips, I wanted to go back into the bathroom and wash my mouth with soap. I was hoping that maybe he was going to sort of have a sense of humor about it, but instead, he just stood there. Ten seconds or so passed, and it felt like ten minutes. He turned around and walked into the bar section. I practically jogged back to my friends, and they could tell that I was a little frazzled, but I played it off cool. At least I thought I did. I just told them that there was some creepy guy by the bathroom, but I scared him off with my intellectual vocabulary. The night continued and I only saw the creepy guy one more time. Maybe an hour before we left, I saw him standing by the door. He was leaning in the doorway, staring in my direction. There was a bunch of people there, so he could have been looking at anybody, but given the previous few hours, I totally believed that he was looking at me. Then, like the wind, he was gone. I didn't let his presence bother me before, and I sure as hell didn't let it bother me now. We continued dancing until the bar was getting ready to close. We were friends with the bartender, so we all gathered by the door and waited for her to close up for the night. She locked the door and we all said our goodbyes in the parking lot. I was parked near the back of the lot because they were so busy when I arrived that it was the only spot. When I was maybe 20 feet away from the car, I noticed a sort of strange shadow coming from the opposite side of my car. I stopped in my tracks and really tried to focus on the window. It was that bearded guy, and he was still wearing his mask and he was trying to break into the back seat of my car. He was slightly crouched, trying not to be seen over the top of the car, and the only reason I could see him was because of the parking lot light that was shining through the windows of my car. He hadn't noticed me yet, so I turned around and flagged down my friend and her boyfriend before they drove off. I pointed to my car and her boyfriend saw right away what was happening. He got out of the car and immediately called the bearded man out. This guy heard him and just booked it into the night. We called the authorities, but they never really could do anything, and just having that little bit of a mask seemed to keep his identity a mystery to us. It freaked me out that he knew what car I drove. 
I can't even begin to imagine what he would have done if I didn't notice him breaking into my car when I did. And I'm just so grateful that I caught my friends before they left because this could have been the worst night of my life if I didn't. So let me be the first to acknowledge that in my mid-twenties, I was a dirtbag. I was a single man that basically was doing whatever I wanted. And when I think back to that time in my life, I tend to kind of cringe. I did a lot of bad things, hurt a lot of people, and truly I was just a piece of garbage. There were a few times, though, that I was served a nice big piece of humble pie, though. Whether it was the cops arresting me or being knocked out because I overestimated my ability... However, one late October night, I was served the biggest piece of that humble pie I mentioned. I hate Halloween, and I always have. I was the kid that went trick-or-treating with my friends without a costume, and I was the same kid that would cuss out the person giving out candy that wouldn't give me any because I didn't have a costume. I told you, I was cringe. This hate for Halloween continued into my adult years. I would date girls that wanted to dress up, and I just refused. And it got to the point where I wouldn't even go to the parties around Halloween because I just didn't get it. One year though, I had a change of heart. Not because I magically started to like Halloween or anything like that. Instead, obviously it was because I met a girl. Her name was Bree and she was my type. I just casually met her at the bar on a random Tuesday night in October and we got to talking and, of course, her love for Halloween came up and she could see my disgust. I told her all of the stories and went on and on about why I hated Halloween, and she seemed to kind of understand but then said in an almost seductive voice, I really think you need to reconsider. Now being the condescending jerk that I was, I laughed and told her no way. She pointed to the corner of the bar and there were three other girls over there. Much like Bree, all three of these women were my type. Bree waved and the women waved back. I was trying to put the puzzle pieces together in my mind, but I couldn't figure out what Brie was getting out. In that same sort of seductive voice, she then says, Those are my girls. We're going to a Halloween party in the middle of the woods, and none of us have dates. You should be our date tonight. I kid you not, that's exactly what she said to me. All I did was smile and continue laughing, mostly ironically, and Brie started to rub my hand and gave me all sorts of good vibes. And without going into details, Bree talked me into this Halloween party. The kind of person I was back then was never going to say no to this type of implication. When I was leaving the bar that night with all of these beautiful women, it never occurred to me just how many red flags there truly were. For starters, who has a Halloween party on a random Tuesday night? Was it possible? Of course, but not very likely, I guess. Also, who just trusts some random dude at the bar to escort them to the woods? They didn't know me at all. I realize people meet each other in bars all the time and go to parties and gatherings, but the circumstances here just seemed very strange. But I was an ignorant guy, and the way that I saw it was that I got to spend my evening with four beautiful women, and I had a full night of fun on my mind. I drove my car with Bree and one of the other girls. The other two women drove separately. I was instructed to follow the other car because she knew the way to the party. This was before GPS's, so this was my version of a GPS that night. We drove for a while, long enough that I was starting to have doubts about my decision making. Bree was smart and attentive though. Every time I thought of doubt passed through my mind, it was like she kind of knew. And that's when she'd kiss my neck or start saying some wild things and the doubt would all disappear just like that. And finally, the car in front pulled over to the side of the road and I followed suit. Wherever we were, there wasn't a light to be found. Two of the girls pulled out flashlights and sort of gestured for me to follow them. There was a small path that almost looked hidden in this thick brush on the side of the road. The three women walked in front with the flashlights and Bree and I followed from behind. I was trying to listen for any type of noise like music or talking but just heard nothing but the sort of quiet stillness of the forest. Without any notice... The girls in front started to sprint. Now Bree held me back. At this point I was just going along with anything. She started to guide me back towards one of the trees and was so dark that I could barely see. There was just enough moonlight that I could barely make out the details of her face. When I finally felt the tree on my back, 
Bree looked up at me like she was going to kiss me. I closed my eyes and sort of leaned in for a kiss, and that's where everything changed. Instead of locking lips, I was hit in the head with the backside of what I think was a flashlight. I covered my head instinctively because it hurt really bad, and that's when another shot from the flashlight came down on top of my head. That strike got me down on my knees. I didn't realize that Bree had a purse when we were walking. When she was guiding me toward the tree, she quietly pulled it out and I didn't notice it until she struck me in the head with that as well. While I was down, I could hear the sounds of footsteps rapidly approaching, and I glanced from my near fetal position and saw the girls from before coming directly at me. Instead of helping me like I thought maybe they would, they started to beat me down with the flashlights as well. And before long, I was in the full fetal position trying to cover my head. All four women were beating me with the flashlights while throwing in some high-heeled kicks in the ribs. They took my wallet, and they took my cell phone. Now at the time I was broke and it was just some crappy flip phone, but at least if I had had that I could have called the police. After they grabbed the wallet, they kicked me a few more times and ran back the way they came. And I even heard the car drive away, and I just laid there down on the dirt ground for a long time. I finally got up, and I walked towards my car. It felt like a truck had just hit me. Thankfully, they couldn't find my keys, but they did smash my windshield and passenger side door. I was in so much pain, but... I drove until I found a 24-hour gas station and had the lady there call the police. So I ended up giving the names and descriptions of the women to the police, but needless to say, they never found them. Clearly, this Bree, it wasn't her real name. The entire time I followed that car, I never bothered to even pay attention to what type of car it was. I didn't even know if it was black, dark gray, or even some navy-colored car. And it wasn't long after that night that... I truly started to make some changes to my life. I'm lucky that I was able to crawl away from that with just a few broken ribs, and it freaks me out sometimes when I think about those girls and realize that they're probably still out there. And even now, in my late 30s, I still hate the Halloween season. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, or send them over email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to shake your big harvest moon.